Uh, now we're gonna have a talk about Active Directory Password Blacklisting, and let's welcome Lauren Cheng. Hey guys, so today I'll be doing a talk on something called Active Directory Password Blacklisting. And I'm sure most of you guys know Active Directory, along with Open LDAP, are two of one of I'll just are two of the most common directory services tools used today in most corporations. And specifically, I'm going to talk about how you can employ Active Directory password blacklisting into your internal networks and the benefits this will provide. So what we've seen in the past couple of years is a lot of times corporations might try to enforce more stringent password requirements by upping the complexity or, for example, requiring that certain categories are met, or maybe even expiring these passwords. And I'm going to talk about why this sometimes isn't necessarily a good idea up to a certain point. And we'll explicitly talk about how Active Directory password blacklisting, for example, can solve a lot of these problems. So <clears throat> just a brief presentation outline. First, I'll give a brief overview on what Active Directory is for anyone who doesn't know. Then I'll give a brief history on password requirements. And from this, I'll branch towards the need for Active Directory password blacklisting. And then my expectation of this is I'm going to show a demo, and I'm going to show how easy it is to install Active Directory onto your domain controllers. I'm going to do a live demo for that. And then I'm going to talk about how we installed it here at the company I work with, which is Yelp. Um, so I'll talk about the various commercial options we explored, and then how we kind of changed to picking an open source solution and kind of toggling that to fit our needs. And then that's when the demo will actually start, and I'll show you how to install it really quickly. Um, and then just some brief transition thoughts. As someone who is primarily Unix-based programmer, like some thoughts I had moving to a more Windows-oriented programming environment. Um, and then I'll talk to you guys about how you can create a testing framework around Active Directory password blacklisting. And then I'll just do some results that we have here at Yelp and then some final reflections. Um, before we jump into this, though, I'm from Yelp. Yelp is supporting about 50 million businesses worldwide. We have like 300 services. And we're not actually all about restaurants. We do a lot more than that. For example, like home services as of 2017, was about 20% of all of our revenue. So that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so what is Active Directory? So most of you probably know Active Directory as a database system, which it primarily is, right? It's a database system for organization of objects on a network using this hierarchical logical structure. And it's comprised of three logical co components, which are domains trees, and forests. So basically you have domain network objects, right, which can be users, computers, whatever. And then these form trees, which are all along the same contiguous namespace. And at the very top, you have the forests, which represents trees and domains sharing the same logical structure. <clears throat> and in terms of a security perspective, these forests represent the outermost layer behind different domain object groups. So you could maliciously change the network configurations within domains of the same forest, but not between different forests. Um, and as you all might know, it's also primarily used as an identity provider for many single sign-on solutions. You guys might also use it for authentication for internal network services or whatever corporations you utilize. And a lot of people think LDAP and Active Directory are two of the same things. So Active Directory is the actual database system, right? And then LDAP is one of many protocols that Active Directory can use for communication between different objects and manipulation of different network objects. So that was just a brief overview on Active Directory. I'm sure you guys already knew all of this. Um, so now let's talk about password requirements real quickly. So. No matter what corporation you use, you're probably going to use some sort of requirements that look like the following. You're going to have between X and Y characters, right? 
And you're going to make sure sometimes that it doesn't contain certain words, like this might be the user handle or some PII data related to your employee, like first name or last name. And then maybe inclusion of some certain categories. You might want some uppercase, lowercase, numbers, non-alphanumeric digits. Um, and a lot of times, and this is recommended by the NIST before, which is expiring your passwords after a certain time. So I just wanted to talk about this briefly. Um, and what I wanted to say is sometimes this trend of upping the complexity by toggling these requirements doesn't necessarily make sense and isn't necessarily efficient. So of course, enforcing a certain minimum password requirement will always make sense because otherwise you can't prevent against brute force or dictionary-based attacks on very simple common passwords. And of course, it also makes sense to always allow your employees or users to make their passwords as long as they want up to a certain point because it's all going to be you know, hashed and salted in your databases later. However, what does not necessarily make sense is ensuring a minimum password length that is above something like 12 to 14. And the reason behind this is it actually makes it cumbersome for the user. The same applies to inclusion of too many categories. You're basically increasing the entropy to a point that makes it very hard for users to remember their passwords. I mean, we all know those various obscure bank accounts where they require like three or four more different categories and we don't even remember them. So the point here is it's not necessarily efficient. And this also applies for password expirations. So the NIST isn't necessarily recommending this either. It only really makes sense, especially assuming that you have 2FA configured for all your devices already. It only really makes sense to expire passwords if they've been deemed to be compromised or susceptible to a breach or seen in some sort of dump. And I'm going to explain exactly what I mean in a second. But this all centers around the idea that he humans are very much predictable, right? If Bob uses a very stupid password like password, and then suddenly the requirements are changed to ensure you also have to have a number, there's a very high chance Bob will use password one as their password. So to summarize, why should we integrate password blacklisting in AD? And what was the point I was trying to make from this? So I have three main points. The first is complexity doesn't necessarily override predictability. Just because your passwords are complex doesn't mean they're not very commonly used. And the second is complexity doesn't override breachability. And I made up the word breachability so it sounds nice, but you get the point. Um, so basically, leaked passwords will always remain a standard attacking vector. And we always want to prevent against, against this. And this brings me to the last point, right, which is complexity doesn't protect against dictionary attacks. Nowadays, one of the most common attack vectors are these leaked password dumps that we use dictionary attacks against. For example, LinkedIn in 2008 or 2012, they got hacked by a bunch of Russians. And this is what you call password spraying. There is a very good chance that those credentials utilized by those LinkedIn employees were also being used for other different websites or organizations, right? Password spraying is the term to reflect this, and it's extremely common nowadays. So this is where Active Directory password blacklisting comes in. And given how popular it's used as a directory services tool, it makes sense to always just have this installed in whatever corporate systems you're working on because it's incredibly easy and it just gives you such a high defense layer um, against these targeted attacks. Um, so why don't we do a Yelp? So we knew we wanted to integrate some sort of active directory password blacklisting mechanism into our services. Um, so at first, I was tasked at like, figuring out what kind of commercial option we might want to look at. Um, but ultimately, we decided against this. And this might not necessarily be the best decision. Maybe you might disagree. But for us, the reason was there was a lack of transparency. So I'm going to go over a bit exactly how this works later. but. The basic idea is this is a very sensitive service that we're dealing with, right? And 
basically this process that does this authentication is called the local security authority for Windows Active Directory. And in this process called the LSASS, any uncaught exception, if there is one, would cause a crash and yield that blue screen of death we all hate, right? So we really wanted this to be as transparent as possible. And finally, a lesser point is just that we thought it might increase Yelp's attack service area if we relied on this single vendor solution. So given this, we, d we decided, okay, we should install uh, a password filter. How the hell do we do that? And I was actually tasked with this project, and I had no idea like how Windows programming worked or what domain controllers were, so I had to do a lot of research. But it turned out it's pretty simple. You basically have this one interface called a password filter DLL, and DLL stands for Dynamic Linking Library, and I'll explain what that is in a bit. But basically, it's just this one interface you have to put into your Windows System 32 folder, and it's comprised of three functions. One is this thing called initialize change notify. So when your computer or domain controller boots up, this function will be called to indicate whether or not your password filter DLL is loaded. And this one isn't as important. You can just be by default return true. This is called on your DLL to indicate whether a password authentication was actually successful and the password changed. Again, this is only if you do stuff post-authentication, so it's not as important. It's only really this last function you have to implement. And this will make such a huge difference in whatever corporate environments you're working on. You just have to implement this function to perform your password validation and install it into your local security authority or put it in its registry, and then you're done. And I'm going to ex talk to you exactly about how to do all of this. So just to dive into more details, this is basically how the authentication flow works. The client makes a password change request. This goes to the local security authority, which is the Windows service responsible for all these types of authentications and author authorizations. And then for each registered password filter DLL of the local security authority, it will call that password filter function. And depending on whether or not that returns true or false, the password will be committed to the SAM, or Security Accounts Manager, assuming that it was approved by all registered DLLs. So you can actually register more than one DLL, which is really interesting if you have various different types of password-based authentication mechanisms you want to employ. And the Security Accounts Manager, this is just Windows' internal database for storing all these hash credentials. Um, it uses a combination of NTLM and LM hashes. Um, the details of that I'm not as familiar with. I'm sure some of you are, though. Um, but yeah, at the end, finally, these changes are synced to the actual DLL via password change notify, um, and the authentication's done. So that's how the flow really looks like. So knowing this, we did more research, and we explored various um, open source solutions. And we found one that really fitted our needs best, which is called Open Password Filter. And the links are here at the bottom if you want to take a picture. Um, it was actually a fork of this former open source solution that we decided to utilize. And the reason was, well, three main points. First, it was super easy to configure. It provided configurable operability with a SQL database. So all you had to do is you know, pipe a bunch of hashes into your own provision database within your network, and then just connect it with that. And then also, what's very important is it incorporated a service-oriented architecture. So what does that mean? So remember when I said the DLL is extremely sensitive? And I dealt with this initially thinking I could do the DLL on my own. Any crash there, you'll get a blue screen of death, and it's extremely frustrating. So instead, if you have the DLL call another registered service, you can execute this fail open design such that any crash on your service can just by default return true, and you'll never have any issues with the blue screen of death on your DLL itself. And I'll show you how that architecture looks like. So basically, it's very much like the architecture diagram you saw earlier. You have your local security authority. A client password request is sent to this. And then that's calling the password filter on every registered DLL. This, instead of directly authenticating through the DLL code, 
you actually call through your loopback interface this thing called OPF service. So the open source solution is called open password filter. So OPF stands for open password filter. Um, so you call this service, and then that does the authentication for you. And of course, it'll do this authentication using whatever registered SQL server you've had provided. And then, given success or failure, this will then be committed to your security accounts manager. So that's pretty much how the flow looks like. Um, and now, I'm going to show you exactly how you can install one on whatever domain controller you're using. And I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, if you don't know Active Directory, all the authorization and um, authentication is done on the actual domain controllers. Um, so you'll have to install these DLLs on every registered domain controller on your network. So how do you install this? Well, it basically boils down to these steps. And on the right, I've highlighted some like Windows commands you can use to help assist you with this. So first, you want to configure your domain controllers. And I'd suggest just starting with a standalone domain, you know, just run a Windows Server 2008 R2 instance or something, and install your own standalone domain controller. And make sure Active Directory domain services is installed in every one. Next thing you want to do is set up local group policies. This is for testing purposes. You want very bare, minimal password requirements just for testing purposes, so stuff like password um, will be installed into your database and you can make sure that's being blacklisted as appropriate. This is just a convenience thing. And then finally, you know, download your common password hashes. Nowadays, I think the most common one is haveibeenpwned.com, and most of these hashes are all SHA-1. So you can just download them there and then import that into your database, which is the next step. You know, creating the database, importing the hashes. Um, then you want to move your DLL to the systems registry um, and then start your authentication service. So remember, the DLL is calling on this service to do the authentication. And sorry, this is where you actually register the DLL because you have to put it in this notification packages registry so that the local security authority knows to load it on boot. And yeah, if you do this, you're pretty much done. And like the reward is so much. It's really simple. It shouldn't take too long. You really should have this in whatever corporate environment you're using. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> enough with the talking. I'm going to show you uh, how you can do this on in a demo. Oh, the fucking, all right. Can you hear me? OK, whatever. All right, I'll just do it like this. OK, cool. Um, so here I have installed a Windows 2008 R2 server, and I've just configured, you know, Active Directory domain services, and I've installed my own standalone domain. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a database, and we're going to um, have password filtering working. And just to start everything off, I'm going to show you that, and I'm going to turn on the keycaster. So currently, my password is admin1234. If I use the password password, it's going to authenticate because I've configured you know, very bare minimal local security policies. Um, and that's just to show you that doing this works. Um, so I'm just going to revert back to my old one. All right, cool. So I changed it back to admin1234, uh, exclamation mark. This is probably one of the very few times you want to have key casting on when you're typing your password. Um, next thing I'm going to do is just really quickly copy this. Um, so here I have PowerShell open. And the first thing I want to do is I actually want to get this uh, snap in for executing uh, SQL Server commands, which is what I'm using. Um, so let me just add that really quickly. I should have done this before the demo, but oh well. So I'm getting that snap in. Okay, cool. So now we're going to create our database, right? And I hope you guys can see that. I think it's big enough. Um, so first thing we're going to do, oops, that's the wrong thing I copied. Uh, let me just copy this real quickly. All right, everything's going to go perfectly from here, trust me. All right, so the first thing we're going to do, we're going to create a database. And we're going to call it password dump. All right? Next thing we're going to do, we're going to create a table for this. So we're going to create a table for that password dump database using the database object basic schema, and we're going to call it blacklisted. 
And then in blacklisted, we're going to give it two variables, OK? We're going to give it hash ID, which is an int, which is not null, and then a hash, which is a var char. And since they're SHA-1 hashes, we're going to make it length 40. And this, of course, is also not null. So that's done. Next thing we want to do, we want to create a user or login. So logins are for authenticating to the database, and then users are for the, for the, for the specific table. So they're a bit different. So I'm going to create a login. I'll call it a B-Sides Reader. And I'm going to say it has the password uh, equal to, uh, let's say, B-Sides Las Vegas 2018. And I'll give it a default database of what we just created, which is password dump. So that should work. All right, cool. Uh, next thing we want to do is we want to this is why I don't like PowerShell, because you, you can't paste. It keeps dying. OK, here we go. Next thing, we want to create the user. So let's uh, use password dump. And then we're going to create the user. Create user. And let's also call it B-Sides Reader um, for the login B-Sides Reader. Cool. And then finally, we want to give it read privileges. So we're going to give this the role, which is um, uh, we want to execute this SP add role member, and then we're going to give it the DB data reader role for B sides reader. So that should work. Okay, so now I've created a database and I've created a login and a user for accessing that blacklisted table. Um, next thing, I want to show you this directory, right? So I've pretty much installed that thing called OPF, which is Open Password Filter. Um, I've installed a pre-compiled version. There's some small configurations I added from Yelp, but it's pretty much going to be the same thing. You just go to that link you saw earlier and install the pre-compiled version. Um, and you see this hashes.txt file, right? So if I open this, basically I've downloaded a bunch of SHA-1 hashes from haveibeenpwned.com, like the top 1 million or something, and I've also prepended an ID to them. So we have these hashes. Let's import it into our actual table. So I can just do a bulk insert and then password dump dot dbo dot blacklisted. And then I'm going to insert the actual um, hashes, which is from my users slash administrator slash hashes uh, file. And it has to use um, these field terminators. So the field terminator in this case is a comma. And then the row terminator is actually a line feed, which you can use uh, this hexamal character for. Um, that should work. OK, so now it's importing, which is awesome. Um, and we can just quickly show that it's actually in there. So select from password dump blacklisted. Um, and yeah, you can see we imported that into our database. OK, so we got the database configured. Uh, and again, you can just rewatch this and just follow what I do, and you can install like password blacklisting into your local orgs. So next thing we want to do is we want to actually uh, register this service. So what we can do is um, in this directory, the pre-compiled directory that you can download, you'll see the four files, the DLL, the actual service executable, a configuration for that, and also this nice uh, testing executable just for testing the service itself, not the DLL, of course. So in that configuration file, there's a bunch of predefined keys and values you can add to this. Since I have this uh, you know, standalone domain controller that's going to be on localhost, in the database we call it a password dump, right? And then the table name was blacklisted. The username was B-Sides Reader. And the database was uh, B-Sides Las Vegas 2018. Uh, I think, yeah, that should be it. All right, cool. So we configured the installation configuration file. And now the next thing we want to do is actually install the service. So if we go to windows.net64 uh, um, v2, and then it's called install util.exe, we can actually just install the service. And again, this is all on PowerShell. Um, so that's been installed successfully. Next thing we want to do is we want to move the DLL itself into Windows System 32. So let's copy that really quickly. So copy the DLL into um, Windows System 32.
cool. Um, and that should be it. Next, we actually want to quickly start the service. Um, so SC start OPF. OK, the service has started. We installed a database. We imported some hashes into it. We configured the installation configuration. We put it to system 32. We started the service. Um, that should be it. So next thing you want to do is remember I told you that these DLLs are only loaded by the LSA during boot. So you have to restart your computer. Um, so I'll just do that really quickly. Uh, I, f I feel like there's one thing I forgot. I hope this live demo works well. It's taking a huge risk. It's going to work. Don't worry. All right. So um, cool. That's going to take a while. I don't want you guys to wait for it to shut down. So while that loads, I'll just give you another slide, um, some implementation gotchas. Um, is there a question? OK. Um, so some implementation gotchas, especially if you don't want to use an open source solution or if you want to install your own DLL yourself or configure your own DLL or your own service. Um, one thing, any crash in this process means you'll get a blue screen of death, which means you'll need like a kernel debugger if you're actually going to do all the coding logic in the DLL, so I don't suggest doing that. Completely replacing a DLL actually requires two reboots, so one for actually clearing the registry and the other for actually loading the library. Um, and like I said, this DLL is only loaded during boot by the local security authority uh, via this notification registry of the local security authority. Um, and then, yeah, the DLL has to be installed on every network domain controller. So don't forget that. Don't, don't just have it installed on one. Uh, otherwise, authentication piped to other domain controllers won't work. And another interesting gotcha is uh, these password policy error messages. They're hard coded into that uh, into the Microsoft operating system, so you can't change the the message that says these password requirement complexities aren't met, which can be a good thing or a bad thing depending on your needs. Um, let's see if it finished. It still didn't finish. Okay. So just here's some thoughts I had transitioning from a Unix programming environment to more Windows heavy, especially with PowerShell. First thing is, what's a dynamic linking library? I didn't know what that was. Now I know it's pretty much like the .lib files, except it's shared memory that you don't have to compile when importing libraries in. It's all shared in one contiguous memory chunk um, on demand when your program's loaded. Another thing I learned is I really like using PowerShell. I thought you know, the transition was pretty seamless, moving from Bash to PowerShell. Um, the programming language is really intuitive, I thought. I, I just, I don't know, I really had a great time using it. Other question I had is, what's a domain controller? You know, I didn't know what this is, but this is where all the authentication authorization is done um, for Active Directory. I also thought it was incredibly convenient that Unix and Windows use the same line terminators. So this made it really easy when I was programming in, in Unix um, and then moving to Windows. Another thing I, I, I asked myself is, how do I debug an LSAS process without going crazy? So this part was pretty hard. Um, it was kind of mundane. It tried, kind of really stressed me out. So again, that's why this service-oriented architecture suited our needs so well. And then another interesting question is, how do I test LDAP authentication across the domain of 1,000 plus users? So this is an interesting question. I'll talk about this in the testing framework part. And if you guys, I don't think you guys realize this, but this was extreme sarcasm. And this was also sarcastic. Um, all right, let's see if it actually installed. So uh, let me just log in. Um, and I'll show you the password I'm using, which is admin1234. Um, that's weird. I never got that before. OK. <laughs> Jeez. All right, let's hope this works. So if I open CMD, um, one thing I want to show you again is I'm using really um, minimal password complexity requirements. So if I theoretically change the password, it should work. Um, it, I mean, it should get blacklisted. Another thing we want to check is that the DLL has been uh, 
registered into the LSA's registry. So we can do that by doing something like um, reg query, uh, I think it's hklm slash system current control set control LSA and then you can search for notification packages. So we can see that it, it has been registered. And another thing we can do is we can query that the OPF service is running. So it does seem like it's running. Um, another thing is that's useful is this uh, open source pre-compiled version. It, can, it, it, it provides a testing framework. So you can just check whether, um, what? Uh, that is really weird. I've ne that's just outrageous. I've done this demo like ten times. I've never gotten this star failure, so I'm really sorry about this. This is this is crazy. Uh, sorry. Oh, I actually I used the wrong um, executable, so it's all good actually. I was just using the wrong executable. So it provides a testing framework called OPF Test Password, and this just tests that the service authentication works. Um, and as you can see, testing the password password uh, results in a failure. But let's see if the DLL actually works. So if you change your password, and again, I'll show you what I'm typing. Uh, sorry, my old password was admin1234. Now if I try password, it says it's unable to update the password. So that was all live. Um, it actually is a lot harder than it looks, but everything worked, which is nice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so that shows you how easy it is to install everything. Um, now I'll talk about how you can test and deploy this. Um, and at Yelp, we pretty much divided it into four phases. First thing you want to do, identify what kind of passwords you want to deploy, especially depending on the policies you set. You might want to use um, a different set of passwords meeting your policies. Um, also, depending on the scale of your users or employees, uh, you want to adjust accordingly. Um, so first phase, identify your passwords. Second is you want to test your password filtering service on a standalone domain, You know, just like what I did. Just run up a Windows 2008 server R2 instance. And then hopefully you have a development domain configured or a lab domain with multiple domain controllers that you can finally test this with. And then you want to slowly roll this service out to production servers in something I call non-enforcement mode, which means at first you want it running, but you don't want it actually authenticating or blacklisting. You just want to log that it would have otherwise succeeded. And then after a while, like two or three months, and you know, making sure everything is what it looks like, then you can actually run it in enforcement mode where you actually deny the passwords. So phase zero, acquire passwords. This should be pretty simple. It looks something like this. You just gather a bunch of compromised passwords um, or SHA-1 passwords. And if they're you know, plain text already, just SHA-1 them yourself. Like on the right, you can see some scripts for doing that. Um, and then maybe you want to filter these against those um, conforming to your policies. These are just some random policies I made at the bottom. And then you want to move to your actual testing framework. So what we did was uh, we kind of divided this dump of passwords we got into four different groups. In reality, there's only two groups you care about, right? Which is whether they're in the dump or whether they're not in the dump. And again, this is all for testing purposes. But because there's also this you know, pre-authorization done on whether the complexity requirements are met, we divide it again into two more groups. So you have four in total. And this is just for completeness sake. Um, so yeah, in num uh, for number two, step two, just generate SHA-1 hashes of those you plan to put in your password dump so that they're in your actual blacklisting database. And then finally, you generate a PowerShell script that, or whatever script you want, that basically tests whether these resets and LDAP binds are actually being successfully done. So if it's not in the password dump, but meets the complexity requirements, it should authenticate, right? So you're just testing the expected behavior of all these groups using something like a PowerShell script with you know, resets and LDAP binds. And then of course, at the end, you want to log all your results, including the average reset time. Um, so that's what this looks like. You know, I divided the password into four different categories, and then 
just ran this huge PowerShell script for verifying the behavior, i.e. that for each you have an expected outcome and an actual outcome, and you want to make sure these are the same. They're all correlated properly. So just in terms of the results, we got a uh, Yelp. So the left diagram, uh, it doesn't really mean anything because no password filter DLLs were configured. So the fact that the, uh, the, the last right columns are kind of different, it's just random. Um, but then in the results with the DLL configured, you can see that the average time, of course, and this includes passwords which are in the blacklist. So of course, the, the time will be a lot lower. But what you'll notice is the yes policy no dump in the right side and the yes policy no dump on the left side are pretty much the same. So the overhead was almost minimal. You couldn't even notice it. So that was the standalone domain. Um, next, you want to move to the actual lab environment, right? So it's going to be the same as I talked about earlier, except you're going to do some more things differently. So you want to be indexing these logs to your sim somehow, right? So you can make something in like syslog with whatever timestamp to do this. And you also want to do additional cross-verification check with Windows events logs. So 4723 and 4724 are the codes for success and failure, respectively. And then finally, um, you want to toggle between enforcement and non-enforcement modes. So when you slowly roll this out into prod, um, you want to make sure that non-enforcement mode is toggled just in case there was something you missed. And then slowly look at the results from your sim data, your logs, whatever, and make sure everything is correlated. And once that's guaranteed, then move it to actual enforcement mode where you're actually denying these blacklisted passwords. So that's probably going to look something like this, you know, putting it in this Splunk. Um, and being able to index all this, like having this ability to see everything very conveniently. That's what sims are for, right? Um, and yeah, at the end, we, we got these uh, average results, which are that um, most of these password uh, DLLs, they didn't impose any overhead whatsoever. It was extremely marginal. Um, and then yeah, finally you put it into production. And yes, I spent most of my time making these planes. Um, so that, that's about it. Um, final reflections, always ensure good communication between all teams. Most of the people I was working with was uh, remote in London, and I was the only guy in San Francisco. So ensuring that everything was documented um, was very, very, very important. And that, that's the second point I wanted to make. You know, also, you want to be very patient with everything, especially if you do plan on making your own custom DLL and maybe using a kernel debugger. You want to be very patient. And the last thing is, I hope I don't touch PowerShell again. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't get why you guys didn't find the sarcastic comment that funny. I thought that was hilarious. Uh, anyway, uh, that's about it. Um, I have a blog post which details all of this. Um, so you can check that out. Or you can just search Yelp Active Directory Password Blacklisting. It'll include the code for the testing. Um, and I think also the code for, or steps for install, installing your DLL. Um, and then lastly, Yelp's hiring, especially for the security team. I'm part of the corporate security team. So if you're interested, you can talk to me later. Uh, but that's it. So thank you. That's just what you used inside the DLL. Yeah, so if you look at most password dumps these days, most of them will be hashed already. And I think you'll find that SHA-1 hashes are the most common. But the actual authentication flow works in such that you have the password passed to your local security authority. And then that actually, so your DLL service will SHA-1 hash that password and compare it with what's in the dump. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of discussion over the past few months about yeah. how large blacklists should be. Mm. Uh, if you make them too long, you know, if you use Troy Hunt's half a billion passwords, 
you're going to really annoy users. Right, right. And if you make it too short, you're not getting the effect that you want. So uh, yeah. do you have any opinions on how, how large are yours? And do you have opinions on what the appropriate size is? Um, yeah, so we use about, I think it was like 10 to 100 million, and we didn't really face any performance constraints. And also, depending on where you're sampling these passwords from, you might, for example, be sampling a bunch that conform to your password policy. So we did take, a, like for the SHA-1 hashes, you can't know unless you like do a dictionary attack yourself with a bunch of GPUs. But for those that you do know, you can actually filter them against those that pass your password policies and then SHA-1 those yourselves and put them in. Um, and another, another interesting thing you can do, which is really effective, is so we at Yelp, not only do we sample these commonly used passwords, but we created our own using some algorithms that would add words like Yelp or maybe even the months of the year because they're extremely popular and will be used by your employees, trust me, yeah, um, yeah. For the filtering message, have I included the hash ID? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 could be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you're a testing framework. So what I showed wasn't our actual official Splunk index. It was just something I generated. But yeah, that's the one you get from the login message as a user when you fail as a user. Oh, right. So the user can say, you know, this was the hash ID. So uh, I. Right. I said in an earlier slide, though, it doesn't seem like you can change that message because it's hard-coded into Microsoft's operating system. So unfortunately, you can't configure that. I didn't know um, that came from the filtering DLL or not. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's this default message that's always returned on a password authentication failure. So you can't, you can't change that, unfortunately. Um, Quick practical question about updating the password list across the domain controllers. How do you do that? Up Okay, so that's the reason the service-oriented architecture is so great, right? So the database doesn't necessarily have to exist in your domain controller. The domain controller is only calling this DLL, which calls upon the service, which can... So currently, yeah, we're doing that. And I guess that's why he asked about scalability concerns. So that is something we have to think about. Um, Okay, so, oh yeah, okay, so, so actually what we did is we, I understand your problem, and because of this, we explicitly targeted the most commonly used passwords instead of just random password leaks, and that's how we got the top 10 or 100 million from various sources with haveibeenpwned.com being just one of them, because we ran tests on this and we did realize like almost all of these either weren't conforming to our password policy or were just too so obscure that no one was using them. Um, and again, this is for our internal corporate systems. We do something entirely different for actual user authentication. Since the error message in Windows can't be updated directly, did you have a user education outreach type session or when this new blacklist was implemented? Right. That's actually something that's ongoing, which is a great point you're making, which is how do we notify the users um, that this error message might mean that they've been blacklisted. So that's where the logging infrastructure comes in. So you can configure these logs to detail this, the specifics of why a user was blacklisted or not. And currently what we do is we basically scrape these logs and then email our individual employees or users who have been compromised through this attack. But you know, developing a better strategy for this is something that we're currently thinking about. Um, I mean, the biggest problem with me is I just didn't know anything about PowerShell, and it was really stressful learning about how to debug everything. But after you, like, if I had this demo, 
And if I could see this demo I just did when I was doing it, it could probably take me a week, honestly, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Have you guys advanced beyond this where you're searching your SAM database against knowns? Um, against known password dumps? My question is, have you gone beyond this where you're actually searching uh, passwords that are already in your database, hashed however Microsoft's doing it in your domain, mm -hmm. um, and you're alerting those people, your password's a very common one, you need to change it. Right, so we're, we're like I said to him, we haven't developed um, an accurate pipeline for telling employees that they've been compromised because of blacklisting. We've only made it really general at this point, and right now what we're doing is these emails through scraping of the logs, which isn't very efficient, but this is a relatively new service, so we're actually doing that right now. It should be done pretty soon. Hey. Yeah. Uh, do you know if there is any way to use kind of a wildcard to avoid certain words from being used? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why this DLL is so useful. Like we we added some of this logic to our password filtering service too. You can just put that in the service that the DLL calls, whatever type of you know pattern matching you might want to do. You can put it in that. It's really easy to configure. It's just basic regex. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, just a, another quick question about the service. Uh, because it is a service, I assume that a couple of things, it can be run on uh, one instance or on a distributed uh, framework, mm -hmm. potentially, and also um, uh, if you can write your own uh, rules in that service, can do things more than just regex, can it use like custom functions and things like that? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's all up to how you want to program it. The The baseline is you have this DLL with this interface, and you can implement these functions uh, however you want. So, yeah, it's really, really, you know, flexible. I was wondering, I, I don't know, uh, is there a way to check for, uh, and this is not exactly what you're talking about, but is, is there a way for, to check for duplicate characters of any character in a password? Yeah, you can, you can just uh, do that function. So... So the DLL is just this file that will call whatever service you've registered. And your service can be run in like C Sharp, C++, or whatever. And you can do all of this filtering on your own. It's just like basic code matching. So you could definitely do that. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's something a lot of people do, actually, which is duplicate consecutive characters. I, 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 what I'm confused about is that, for example, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your password was 12 characters long, yeah. uh, how, would it, how would it know that uh, the, you, you typed A twice and that, and that position of the A twice was you know, 10 characters in versus two characters in, in the hash that you have. Oh, okay, sorry. So um, the LSA, right, the password that it gets passed is actually in plain text. That's why this is such a you know, sensitive service that you want to make sure is very secure. And then it does, so you would do the checking there, and then you'd hash it and compare it against your database. Um, but that's why, yeah, there's a lot of security concerns, and a lot of people might ask, like, oh, what if you pipe it to, you know, a local host? What if someone's sniffing on your domain controller? Um, but usually the, the general response is if, if a, a malicious hacker has compromised your domain controller, you have much bigger things to worry about, right? Yeah. Anyone who would like to ask? Um, how nervous were your sysadmins when you deployed in production? I'm, I'm sorry, what? How nervous were your sysadmins when you deployed this in production? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's why I emphasize this non-enforcement and enforcement mode. So we were doing non-enforcement mode for almost like one and a half months, and I could do a bunch of aggregation on the data we've already employed, and we knew there were no issues whatsoever. So it was just a matter of resetting the service with enforcement mode, turn it true. So I wasn't nervous at all, actually. You, you mentioned that you're still kind of in the process of, of the user education component of this. Do right. you have other plans for expanding this or changing the way that you've got it implemented yet, or is that still something that will come with time? Um, I think 
this is probably the final part. I don't really see any other issues. Like we have the password filtering installed. We have the logging infrastructure there. It's just making the whole pipeline more efficient for when someone got compromised and it's in their log to directly messaging the user for why this is the case. Um, but that should be the final part, yeah. Questions? Last chance, questions? I think that's it. All right, cool. So, Thank you guys so much.